Well, good good midday, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you all may happen to be, and welcome. Uh, we at the U.S. Ukraine Foundation, the Ukraine Network, are happy to have you here. Uh, we've got an excellent panel here to discuss the subject of the day, which is we had a NATO summit last week, and uh, what what does that mean for Ukraine? Where are we now? Uh, our panelists, I'll go in alphabetical order. Uh, General Phil Breedlove, uh, former Supreme Allied Commander in Europe, among a lot of other things. Uh, Ian Brzezinski, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for European and NATO Affairs. And Ambassador Sandy Birschbaum, former ambassador to Russia and former deputy secretary general of NATO. I don't think we could have a finer panel to talk about what happened at NATO and where things are now, especially for Ukraine. Uh, I'm gonna try and stay out of the way here and let, this, and let the uh, uh, panelists talk. And with that, I will first, uh, Phil, I'll, I'll turn to you, General, and have you start off. Okay, Bob, thanks for uh, uh, inviting me, and uh, I love this panel. I basically worked for Sandy when we were at NATO for a while, and, and I respect his work immensely, and Ian is one of the smartest thinkers uh, in this business. And so uh, I will try to provide context at my level of mental acuity. I, I really believe that there are two things I would like to talk about coming out of the the NATO meetings that are reflecting into today. Uh, and then I'll let the others carry some of the more weighty material. The first thing that I would like to say is uh, NATO is working pretty hard and I think very well to better prepare NATO for any outcome that would be other than uh, Ukraine. So in, in other words, if NATO is involved in this, um, becomes involved in this because Russia makes a choice or Russia makes a mistake, I believe that NATO is doing a good job of better preparing itself for that. I, I do want to say more is required. Um, so the, the ability and, and the path that we're taking to move more battle groups into the forward area, to look at our force dispositions and weapons in the forward area. This is all going well. Um, and, and oh, by the way, it gives Mr. Putin exactly what he didn't want as a reward for his misbehavior. And so we see uh, more force and capability moving into the forward areas. Um, if you remember all the way back to the Wales conference, uh, and Sandy, you'll remember that we talked about these forward battle groups. Uh, and back then they started out company size and then grew into battalion size later. But we started talking about these things being highly enabled. In other words, having forward the things like artillery, uh, ISR, um, and the heavy things that would make that force capable um, should we ever have to use it. Good news is the nations have really come through with getting the forces forward. Bad news is we have not come through with the enabling port part. So if I was to uh, grade our paper and suggest follow on action, it would be to continue looking at those tough to move heavy enabling forces that these forces need. And then frankly, uh, I think we are still in need of more American force in Europe. And I, I'm sure that some will take me on in this later. The second piece that I'd like to talk to, and then I'll get off the stage, is that a lot of NATO nations have sort of intimated their support for Ukraine. And some of those nations are doing a really good job of pushing forward the things that they promised. There are some nations, and I would put the United States firmly in the center of this, that are not doing a good job of pushing forward what they have promised. The United States, I think, was slow to start moving stingers forward. 
and uh, and that I think has hurt us in the long run. And now we need to double up to catch up, if you'll allow me to use a, a, a colloquial phrase. And the second piece is that um, there are some big end items that we believe they need. And we have been talking about a, for a long time, and yet we still have not produced things like medium and high altitude surface to air defenses, coastal defense cruise missiles, et cetera, that are hung up in conversations and I believe that all the nations, those that might supply them and the United States that will probably be a part of some deal that is cut, we need to get very, very senior uh, leadership in this country laser focused and watching every day to see if we're moving forward in delivering some of these capabilities we've been talking about for a long time. And I'll close this piece out with, the Ukrainian army has been fighting hard for over a month. And I think we need to do some very close introspection with their senior most leadership about some of those more mundane things that they're requiring right now. Ammunition, uh, artillery rounds, medical supplies, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, I guess my big plea is that um, we are, I, I will use a critical word. We are underperforming in supplying Ukraine and we need to get laser focused on this. The senior most people in our government need to be holding people accountable for the movement of these items. And I defer at that. Thank you, Phil. Um, Sandy, why don't we go to you? He deferred to you saying that he used to work for you, so you can comment. And as he often says, great as paper. <laughs> yeah, well, in the spirit of civilian control of the military, <laughs> I was a humble deputy secretary general, but uh, Phil was always very responsive. Always took my calls, even in the middle of the night. Uh, and we did go through uh, what could be viewed as the dress rehearsal for this crisis, it was the first invasion of Ukraine by Russia back in 2014. And uh, it took NATO a little little time to fully uh, absorb what was happening in those days, but uh, it did ultimately rise to the occasion. And I think we're seeing that again, even though I think Phil has raised some very legitimate issues about uh, where our performance, both NATO and the US in particular, could be improved. But the uh, overall, I think the summit meetings in Brussels, and there was a trifecta. There was NATO, there was uh, G7, and the uh, EU summit where President Biden participated. They were put together to kind of mark the one month point in the, uh, in the war. And uh, with a political goal <clears throat> of highlighting the, the unity of the, of, of the allies and of, of the West more generally, uh, their solidarity with the Ukrainian people in the Ukrainian armed forces uh, as they face this uh, Russian aggression. And it was to uh, reinforce the alliance, ensure, as Phil said, that there's no spillover of the conflict from Ukraine and that NATO is prepared for every contingency, including what was a prominent theme in, in the discussions, at least potential use or threatened use by Russia of chemical weapons and God forbid, nuclear weapons. So I think as a, as, a, as a unity fest, the summits were, uh, were very successful and it wasn't just symbolism. There were a lot of decisions taken, uh, perhaps more in the non-NATO areas, although NATO did take these very important decisions about uh, deploying four new battle groups uh, along the Southeastern flank, Romania, Bulgaria, Slovakia, and Hungary to go with the four uh, battalion sized battle groups that have been in Poland and the Baltic States since 2017. That's a very important step, although it's only the beginning because clearly the new normal with Russia is going to be a much more persistent 24-7 uh, threat, which could potentially uh, overrun these battle groups as we've design designed them right now. And I think that building on the uh, very initial decisions that were taken at the summit, NATO is gonna have to develop a longer term plan for a much more robust, permanent presence along the Eastern flank uh, 
and probably a paradigm shift from what is essentially deterrence by tripwire, deterrence by punishment, but not necessarily with sufficient capability to hold back an invasion force, has to move to de deterrence by denial. And that means much. That means very significant expansion of the of the forward presence with those enablers that are critically important, uh, and that's going to mean more defense spending, more investments required by all the allies, not just the United States. And that's where I see this as an opportunity uh, as NATO looks to its new strategic concept, which is being drafted for the summit in June, uh, to look at a much more uh, robust division of labor between Euro Europe and the United States, uh, because the US was, is still gonna have to worry about other threats, not just uh, the now overarching Russian threat, but the continued challenge from China, new kinds of threats to the to uh, cyber networks, to social stability. This whole issue of resilience needs to be addressed more seriously by the Alliance. So NATO has done some good things to kind of uh, send message to the Russians, don't even think of crossing the border in the current crisis, but we'll need to do a lot more to deter uh, Russia down the road. There are good decisions also on uh, helping the refugees, expanding humanitarian aid, and of course, some additional sanctions were announced at the summit meetings. But I think in what should be the, the main focus of our discussion today, obviously, is uh, Ukraine's fight to, to beat back the Russian aggression. Uh, the summit did, didn't uh, produce any kind of major decisions. Uh, they pledged to continue to support the Ukrainian armed forces. And there were some announcements uh, on the margins of moving on some of those long delayed systems such as uh, coastal defense missiles and uh, long range air defense, high altitude air defense like the S-300 uh, system. But sadly, uh, nothing seems to have changed even a, a week after the summit. And this issue that Phil raised of sort of lighting a fire under the, uh, the bureaucracy to get these things moving in days, not weeks. Uh, you can't, Ukraine can't afford uh, the kind of lackadaisical approach that is, seems to be taken. I, I know people are working 24 seven over at the Pentagon, but something needs to change in terms of how these uh, systems uh, are handled because the, there clearly is a, a potential inflection point. We're not necessarily there on the battlefield, but uh, Russia clearly is, uh, at least regrouping in part, uh, but this may just be a tactical shift to replenish and resupply their forces. We can't assume that uh, the tide has turned to the point that Russia is actually genuinely interested in peace negotiations. So continued military support to the Ukrainian armed forces, faster delivery of, of systems, addressing sort of unresolved issues such as those MiG-29s that the Poles would like to put it at the service of the uh, Ukrainian armed forces. All these things need to be addressed more, more concertedly in the coming days uh, in the hopes that uh, we can equip the Ukrainians to, to genuinely turn the tide in the coming, coming weeks and, and get a, a fair deal rather than an imposed settlement at the negotiating table. Thank you. Ian? Ian? Well, thank you very much. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Good, good sign. Great. Well, it's always... Uh, uh, a good thing to be in the presence of General Breedlove and uh, Deputy Secretary General Vershbaum, two people who have done so much for the alliance and also have had been on the real forefront of thinking about what was going to happen in Ukraine and have been doing so much to support Ukraine. So it's a privilege for me to be here. I I'm in alignment with much of their thinking, but maybe with a slightly different nuance. When I think of those three summits, the NATO summit, the US-EU summit and the G7 summit, uh, it struck me as a gathering of immense opportunity because it really is an opportunity to marshal the full spectrum of the West diplomatic, economic and, and military power. I mean, you literally had the world's best fighting leaders, of the world's best fighting force convened and $40 trillion of the world's economy, if not more convened there. A lot of potential there. And it, it was a summit that, um, was powerful in some respects in terms of demonstrating the alliances, the West's unity behind Ukraine, 
commitment to the current level of effort they're providing uh, Ukraine. And I have to say, as you know, as a Republican, hats off to the Biden administration, the president himself, for forging this coalition. So it was good to see such solid consensus behind the current level of actions. But I think when you step back and you look at it, it was really more somewhat of rhetoric and messaging rather than action. And that is something I think has to be explored. I mean, you think about it on the economic side. Yes, there were some new sanctions imposed, but were they really meaningful? I mean, sanctioning the Russian legislatures, it's good symbolically, but I don't know how many of them really own that much outside, how much they travel outside. Uh, what was missed was the opportunity to impose a full trade embargo on, on Russia. I mean, particular focus has to be given on the consumption and purchase of Russian oil and gas. Oil, oil and gas. I mean, think about it. Uh, in 2021, $489 billion of Russian oil and gas were bought by the West, predominantly by, by Western Europe. That's over a billion dollars a day. Much of that continues. You can say safely that these sales, these purchases of Russian oil and gas are supplying the Russian treasury, you know, billions of dollars each week, which is used to basically fund the invasion. That is strategically short-sighted. It's morally shameful. And it's probably communicating to Putin that this is real weakness. The West doesn't have the stomach the economic side of a real confrontation with, 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 with Russia. And that just energizes him to continue to move forward. Clearly the military assistance that was highlighted at the summit has been helpful. Uh, it's maybe even given the Ukrainians a little a decisive edge in some of the particular engagements they've had on, in, on, on the battlefield. But as Phil was pointing out, there needs to be more weapons, there has to be more ammunition, more supplies at much higher rates. And as both of my colleagues pointed out, there are some systems there we just haven't moved on and it's beyond me why. And I just hi highlight any ship missiles. As the Russians have been preparing to, to attack Odessa, they should be in place. As the Russian ships are launching cruise missiles into, uh, in, into Ukraine, those missiles shouldn't be just be there, they should be being exercised. It's a real urgent, uh, urgent requirement. The second kind of point I'd like to make is that I'm a little bit worried that not among my colleagues, certainly, but among Washington, some capitals, we're getting a little bit Pollyannish about uh, the situation on the ground in Ukraine. The Ukrainians have, have demonstrated inspirational courage and inspirational leadership from the president. They've been showing real tenacity on the battlefield. They've been exercising and using the equipment the West has provided with real finesse and brutal, brutal effect. Uh, and so people are beginning to almost think as if this is a war that's almost on the verge of being won. And I think it's a little bit premature to say that. I think Putin is in for this for the long run. Unless the pressure on him is intensified, he's going to continue to drive on and grind on. He'll throw more and more untrained reserve. It's simply just to wear down the Ukrainians. I mean, think about the Ukrainians. A quarter of their population are already refugees. Uh, he will continue to drive on. And in a situation like that, I'm not sure time is on Ukraine's side or on our side. And this is where I'll make my third point. And here I'm a little bit more forward leaning than most, but I actually think that, you know, not only is it, you know, our allies have been deeply engaged in supporting Ukraine with equipment and imposing these sanctions, but it's disappointing to me that NATO as an institution isn't involved in supporting Ukraine. It's our allies, not NATO. NATO doesn't provide assistance. It's not militarily engaged. And I'm among those who believe that there is an opportunity and perhaps an urgent priority to create a humanitarian no-conflict zone in Ukraine, leveraging the opportunity created by the uncontested areas that's predominantly Western Ukraine, where there aren't Russian forces. And that's an opportunity for the West and some guys to go in, lock down that space, maybe using the NATO response force, the core for a multinational task force that would go in. It wouldn't involve attacking Russian forces because it's uncontested. You could even leave a zone around that, uh, that secured area between secured area and where Russian forces are. You create a safe haven for the displaced persons, the wounded in Ukraine. They'd rather be in there better treated and helped in Ukraine than abroad. You would de facto ensure the territorial perpetuity of the Ukrainian state, which I don't think we're in a position today to take for granted. 
but creating that space wouldn't be all of Ukraine, but it'd be something of Ukraine that you could be sure they could survive in the long run. This would allow Ukrainian forces to concentrate more effectively against where the Russians are today. They wouldn't have to worry about Russian units in, in Moldova or coming in from, from Belarus because that safe reason would be protected by the alliance or some international force. And then above all, it would demonstrate the resolve in, that Putin needs to hear in the only language that he understands, which, which is action. And so that's something that I, I'm trying to advocate. It's a little bit more forward leaning than the no-fly zone. I think it actually has more effect in the no-fly zone. And it's gonna be one of the steps if you wanna to, want to lock in a, a situation where we can be more confident about the perpetuation of the Ukrainian state in the long run, because this will, we're on track for a long haul in this. We can't take anything for granted. Well, Ian, I'm, I'm, I'm not the expert, but I do think you know, there's a long haul here, both militarily and humanitarian. I mean, the, even, if, even if the war ended on short terms, the humanitarian crisis is gonna go on for years. Phil, you had your hand up and you're one of the experts. I'm he is not. an expert. <laughs> Actually, I, I wanted to, uh, uh, it's not really on our subject, but I wanna throw a slight provocation out there before we go to uh, the audience for Q's and A's. Uh, on something that has worried me. And that is, um, you know, uh, as a military planner, thinker sort of person, there's a lot of things you strive to achieve and to avoid when you're in a, uh, when you're in a war or you're in a contest or however you want to describe what's going on here. Certainly to me, it's a war. A couple of those that are very close to the top of the list is that you want to seek to deter your enemy and not be deterred yourself. And then secondarily, you wanna to seek to have the initiative and not allow the enemy to have the, the initiative and be reactive to the enemy. And my assertion for where we find ourselves right now is we are almost completely deterred and our enemy is not deterred at all. And we have ceded, we gave away the initiative. All of the if-then statements at the beginning of how we, this war kicked off, to me, are a, just a direct demonstration of saying, Mr. Putin, you have the initiative, we will react to you. If you do this, then we'll do this. So I, I know that's going to make somebody unhappy, but I thought that might also kickstart some of the Q&A. And I'll uh, yield back. If I, could, if I could build on that, I mean, one concern that I have about the lessons being learned about nuclear coercion uh, in, in, this, in, in, this, in, in this crisis, in this conflict. I mean, first, you know, Putin has, in the lead up to this conflict, his rhetoric on nuclear threats increased. And that led to a decision by allied countries, including the United States, to actually vacate their forces from Ukraine. I have to think that Putin took note of that. And then after the war began, the mantra of no boots on the ground, justified in the grounds we have to avoid World War III was another response to that nuclear coercion. And then it became even more tactical to the point where we wouldn't provide, we wouldn't allow the provision, we wouldn't provide uh, the MiG-29s uh, to the Ukrainians as they requested. And the justification actually from UCOM, which I know, I'm a big fan of UCOM, but their justification for not providing those planes was nuclear escalation. So I have to wonder what, what is Putin learning from this? Uh, he seems to be learning that the more he can exercise these threats, the more, the more that he gets. And I'm worried that these threats will become more frequent and more aggressive, and that it could actually increase the likelihood of them being acted upon. And then there's a broader question of what are our other adversaries learning from this, from this exactly. exercise? Exactly. Iran, North Korea, China are all watching this, this formula. And frankly, a lot of aspirant nations are going to look at this and say, wow, look how the use of America's military power was affected by Mr. Putin's threats. Not let me just, let me just make it... You 
let me ju just jump in and say I'll make it unanimous. I agree that that has been a flaw in the administration's and the alliance's approach. And sometimes it's a case of just saying too much, uh, removing ambiguity when ambiguity would be to our benefit and keep Putin guessing. That applies to what is escalatory and what isn't escalatory. Uh, sort of almost putting words in Putin's mouth before he even says anything uh, when it comes to the MiG-29s. When in fact, we're sending stingers, we're sending javelins, which are dev doing devastating damage to the Russian force, yet uh, we're not prepared to do something that would just replenish a system that's already in the Ukrainians' inventory and yeah. at least give them a fighting chance to, to control uh, the airspace and, and improve humanitarian conditions on the ground. So that I think is a, is a, a lesson from this. We shouldn't deter ourselves by articulating things that are better left unsaid. Uh, and and uh, on Ian's proposal, uh, I don't know, Phil, if you want to uh, critique it, but uh, I think we need to consider if if we, we aren't approaching a turning point towards diplomacy, and I hope hope we are, but I'm not convinced we are. Uh, then this is going to be a conflict that grinds on for many months, and we we have to do more to deal with the humanitarian situation on the ground. Uh, and Ian's proposal sounds like an interesting alternative I, I to the humanitarian no-fly zone idea that, that that's crashed and burned after our open letter on that. <laughs> yes, and so right after that, as you know, uh, I think I shared with you as well that there were several really well-respected individuals who would rather me champion their thoughts, but they said, we want to create humanitarian quarters, but we want to even more create a humanitarian airlift a la Berlin into Ukraine, not stopping in Poland and then having to fight its way across because we're having issues. So humanitarian quarters, a humanitarian airlift, all under the moniker of a humanitarian uh, no-fly. That was the, the last construct that I wrote an op-ed about. And as you're, uh, Sandy, you're right, pretty much uh, the, the Washington area has dismissed any of those possibilities. But I think Ian is on to something. It, they're all sort of forms of the same thing. We've got to figure out how to get humanitarian relief into uh, places um, like Mariupol uh, because they, they're having a hard time getting out. We need to get in there. So I, I, I would support Ian's uh, thoughts. Well, see, Ian, taken care of. <laughs> I'm, I just, I mean, a comment on that, because I've been part of this trying to get, you know, no-fly zone, humanitarian, no-fly zone, humanitarian corridor. Um, I'll just make this and see what comments you have. My impression is they haven't been turned down. The door's been slammed shut on any of those ideas. Uh, I don't even, uh, I mean, I haven't seen uh, Washington try and figure out some modified version of it. It's just been no. That's why I said, Bob, that we are almost completely deterred. You know, we are doing some things uh, and we're working pretty hard at it. The resupply, trying to make a sort of a proxy effort out of this. Although we're not doing that very well, at least we are doing it. Um, but when it comes to any other option other than sanctions and giving them the tools they need, there is no new thinking in DC. Uh, a, a pretty senior senator who I actually respect on most of his views uh, literally said yesterday, people aren't thinking very smart. They need to think smarter. And that was not in support of us. That was criticizing the fact that we would actually think about putting our airplanes over Ukraine. And I think this is just an indication of how Mr. Putin has, has literally uh, deterred us down to the political level. Not, I mean, it is just this, I think the war colleges and the great IR institutions of the, of the academia need to be thinking about this for the next few years, because I do not believe that we can go through the next 20 to 40 years of history deterred in the manner that we are deterred right now. 
Phil's put it pretty well. I mean, we've literally caught ourselves through our own through our own actions and our own decisions into an escalation trap. And it's it's not helpful for the situation in Ukraine. Uh, it is actually encouraging Putin to drive forward despite the pain that we've imposed upon his forces, the Ukraine has imposed upon his forces and his economy. And it's setting dangerous lessons for our other adversaries. And my fear is, is that, you know, if we assume this is gonna be a long slog and just and sustain ourselves of support, or sustain our levels of support to Ukraine as it is now, we are increasing the risk of disaster because war is unpredictable. I'm looking at my, well, particularly Phil Breedlove here, who knows this firsthand. It is unpredictable and often uncontrollable. And we just cannot just assume that the great leadership the Ukrainians have, their ferocity will be able to sustain this over the long haul. Time is on Russia's side unless we change our course. And it has to be a more, a more assertive course. And there are options out there that can help us achieve what we want, what the Ukrainians need, without creating dangerous risks of conflict escalation. Could I pile on to Ian's remarks? There, there seems to be a group of people in Washington, D.C. that believe that by doing only what we're doing right now, we have a risk-free or more risk-free path forward. I couldn't agree more with Ian. Every day our risk is going up. Every day that Mr. Putin's forces are failing and he's got to create new stories and new spin. And every day that more and more data is leaking into the real people of Russia and they understand what is truly happening. And when the new troop rotation comes up, when this year's conscripts are supposed to go home and next year's conscripts are supposed to come up, which is in the next month, this is going to be really tough for him in the rear. And I think our risk is going up no matter. So this is really a discussion of risk and what risk we want to take. Yes, I ne nobody has ever tried to say from the beginning there was not a risk in any of these options, the various options that have been put forward for humanitarian relief. But, but what has failed to be discussed is no decision to do more now is also decision to increase, to accept ever increasing risk in my mind. Sandy, you look like you wanted to say something. Yeah, I agree that we need to have this discussion about sort of the medium term. How can we, uh, with, a, with a different risk tolerance, have a, have a much more decisive effect? But I think we also need to make the current paradigm work over the next couple of weeks. I mean, every day counts. And uh, the Russians still are in disarray. Uh, this decision to, and we will see if they've carried it out, but to pull, pull back at least a little bit from uh, Kiev and Chernihiv, which they haven't delivered, but it does reflect clearly pressure from within the military on the political leadership to, to reduce their ambitions. This is the time when the Ukrainians need to push even harder, uh, try to dislodge the Russians from some of the gains they've made in the South, so that when we get to a negotiation, which we, which we may or may not, but I think this is heading towards a real negotiation, uh, the Ukrainians will be in a much stronger position to demand a Russian you know, full withdrawal to, to positions on February 23rd and not keep some of their ill-gotten gains in the south and along the Azov Sea, sea Coast. Uh, and, uh, and more fundamentally, uh, a solution that preserves Ukraine as a genuinely sovereign state with inviolable borders and the right to defend itself, all the things that Russia wants to take away. So the next few weeks are gonna be decisive and that's why we have to address those supply chain delays and bureaucratic delays and at least uh, try to spring a few of the systems that are still controversial in the administration, urge them not to be quite so self-deterred as we were discussing before. Well, you know, in, in, in what you're saying, um, it seems to me that part of what the Russians are doing, backing up, resupplying, um, you know, are they backing up or are they regrouping, but they need, they need to fix their own supply lines and so forth. And it's a perfect time for Ukraine to advance. 
does right. Ukraine have what it needs to advance? These supply lines we're talking about, can they take advantage of this opening? Because, you know, I keep hearing that ammunition is low. You know, they're using stingers, they're using javelins, they're running out of them. Are we, are we keeping them uh, up to date with what they need to do their job? I mean, I'm afraid if things are going their way because they are better at fighting, but they're going to run out of what they need to fight. Yeah, I worry that way too. Phil? You know, I, I'd add that, uh, you know, the time to move on something like a no, no conflict humanitarian zone with international forces is now when the Russians are back on their heels and not when their forces are refreshed. And for those who are worried about conflict escalation and, you know, the possible use of Russian, or, uh, possible use by Russia of chemical weapons and such, I would argue that Russia is more deterred from using such systems if there's an international presence in Ukraine than against a Ukraine that's largely on its own. So now is the time to operate because time isn't on our side and because we actually have some advantages that we should be leveraging. Well, before, before we get to a couple of questions, it, it, this goes to what we're all saying. It seems to me, obviously we deterred ourselves as you've well described, but, and, and maybe there was a reason for that, whether it was wise to make it public or not. But it seems to me that once you see the, the world is watching this, this is not being reported from Vietnam by reporters. This is people, this is the Ukrainian, the people of Ukraine are being talked to on national television about what's happening. The world is watching this war firsthand. They are seeing atrocities. And once you see atrocities, can't government say, wait a minute, you know, things have changed. Uh, we need to do something different. I just throw that out there. Um, if somebody wants to comment, and then I'll look at some of these questions here. But we have one, uh, it, it's been here in several different forms. Uh, is there a way that an individual entrepreneur uh, can somehow get himself involved militarily with NATO? I, I'll throw that out if anybody can answer it. Uh, I, I don't think so. Uh, Ambassador Vershbaum may know more about that. I would say, though, there are any number of ways to include your organization, Bob, for entrepreneurs to get involved with um, getting supply and aid to Ukraine. And so I'm not sure if that's what he's asking, but, but there's a lot of ways to, to help get aid to Ukraine. But I, I, I was never approached as the sacker by an entre entrepreneur that had a way of helping me in my military business. Sandy? Well, since you said what you said, I, the U.S. Ukraine Foundation is one of any, I mean, there are a lot of organizations doing things to try and get uh, uh, humanitarian aid and other aid uh, to Ukraine. Uh, the foundation is limiting itself because of its 503C um, status to humanitarian aid. And we have Operation Ukraine Airlift underway uh, with the American Hospital Association, March of Dimes, uh, Doctors Without Borders as partners to uh, get the list from Ukraine of what is needed and then get it. We've got planes going and so forth, but there's, there are other organizations doing it uh, that you can have a pick from. And indeed, you can go to the U.S. Ukraine Foundation's website and not only see what we're doing, but we've listed some other organizations that we know not only are saying what, what they want to do, but are, are delivering on what they want to do. So that may answer some of that. You know, if I could add in on that, now, when I think of entrepreneur, and I, I think of two things, an entrepreneur can be helpful to NATO uh, if he or his organization is developing technologies that can help the warfighter. And NATO has actually programs that's reaching out to the, to the private sector to tap into those technologies. If an entrepreneur is thinking about what he can do or she can do to help Ukrainians, I think Bob and, 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 and Phil put it right on the mark, use those networks and those connections to raise funds. Um, humanitarian assistance costs money and there's not enough of it. Uh, people, there's a need for food, that costs money. There's a need for medical equipment, that, that costs money. There's a need for housing, that costs money. If you can use your networks to raise funds of that and direct them into organizations 
like the U.S. Ukraine Foundation or Americare's Spirit of America. That's something to do. The same thing applies for non-lethal military equipment that's in great demand by the Ukrainians. And there are organizations that are, are seeking resources to buy and that will enable them to buy and transport that equipment. Spirit of America is doing a great thing, uh, raising here in the United States, funding and then using that to buy helmets, uh, medical equipment, uh, body armor and such that they're getting to the Ukrainian Defense Forces. Absolutely, I do. And I, I think I said this when I made the comment about what the foundation is doing. We're women, we, as a 501c3, we can't do anything about military aid. So what we're doing is medical and other humanitarian aid uh, exclusively. But there are groups that are working on uh, getting uh, additional uh, military supplies. Um, <laughs> one, one question here is something that I think among us, we've said on emails and in personal conversation, uh, we're talking about the US government and others giving the Ukraine a chance to defend itself, but it's not about winning. Uh, Putin has to be stopped and he's not gonna be stopped until he is stopped. Um, how does that factor into what we're trying to get our government, NATO and individual nations to do? I guess I'll, I'll, I'll try. <laughs> I think the U.S. government recognized what's, what is at stake. Uh, that is why President Biden is spending so much of his own personal time uh, developing, sustaining, and driving forward this international coalition that has done a lot to help Ukraine defend itself. Th there is recognition that a, a Putin victory uh, could be extremely destabilizing not only for European security, but for global security, because it would, it would really mean the breakdown of the international order, the rules-based international order that has been the foundation of peace, uh, security and prosperity in Europe and in, around, around the globe. I think there's clear recognition of that. The problem is, is that many in the Alliance, including many in Washington, are very concerned about escalation control and have allowed themselves to fall into an escalation trap that is basically neutralizing their ability to use the West's overwhelming advantages to bring this uh, conflict to a, a, a quick and just conclusion. Um, you know, a question here that I think we're, we've been struggling with, but it's being asked by one of our, our uh, audience what do we do to overcome the barriers uh, that are faced in front of uh, getting what is needed to Ukraine? Um, I have some thoughts, but I'll, I'll ask the question of the panel. What can we do to overcome these barriers? So I, I saw that question. It's a magnificent question. And, and I sort of alluded to a little bit of it in, in my remarks about risk. Right now, there is this... Uh, almost, I don't want to use a bad word, but irrational conclusion that if we do anything, Mr. Putin is going to start World War III and hit us with nukes. And he has fostered that environment. He writes and talks to that environment. And actually, he has personally been involved in a big way in establishing this almost complete deterrence of the West. And so we need to break down in a rational way some of those arguments. And that's why I am saying we need to have a conversation about risk. And we need to disabuse people of the fact that if we do nothing more now and we just keep doing what we're doing, the risk goes down or stays the same. It does, in my opinion, it does not do that. It is going up every day. And so... Uh, uh, Sandy and Ian probably have much more cerebral things to talk about, but for me, it's a matter of uh, um, we, we are incurring risk, and if we keep doing no more than we're doing now, that risk will grow every day. I agree with, with that. I think there is a tendency in the Alliance and in some parts of Washington to, to feel we should do just enough to kind of keep 
a kind of a stable stalemate, but there is no such thing as a stable stalemate in this situation, particularly when for Putin, uh, it's still uh, a war against the very existence of Ukraine as a sovereign state. Uh, there's no sign that he has uh, scaled back his ambitions, even though some of his representatives may be speaking in somewhat more conciliatory language. Uh, until Putin starts talking that way, we should be on our guard. So we do have to, I mean, having a theory of victory may sound provocative, but I think we do need to sort of be thinking what can we accelerate? What additional capabilities can we provide to enable the Ukrainians to make, make clear to the Russians that time is on the Ukrainian side? But, but, but we have to strike a balance, not giving the impression we're ready to fight to the last Ukrainian. That at the end of the day, wars of this kind more likely will end in a political settlement rather than a clear victory for one side or the other. And so we have to show that we're prepared to take sens sensible risks, not unlimited risks, but sensible risks to enable the Ukrainians to gain the upper hand so that it, the day when Russia is ready to negotiate comes a lot sooner rather than later. I think we, we're, we're within reach of that point if we play our cards right. I worry we're going to miss this window of opportunity. Putin will regroup. They will begin to retake some of the territory that the Ukrainians are pulling back and uh, we'll be in a vicious circle. We can avoid this if we are a little more decisive, a little more calculated in our assessment of risk than, uh, than we are now. Well, I'm kind of picking off on what Phil said and what you both said. Phil said, we need to have a conversation about risk. How do we, I mean, we're having one now, but how do we have one and get engaged the people that need need to hear and be involved in that so that if we succeed, they change their evaluation of what is a risk and what is a, a reasonable risk. How do we have that? How do we get that conversation uh, taking place with the policy people? I would offer two steps. We need to have this conversation in public more. I have built it into about my last four television spots. And secondarily, all four of us are in a group where we might need to kickstart that conversation with the people who are, are looking at these kinds of issues. And I'll, I'll leave that right there. You know, what I, I build on what Phil is saying is, this is a conversation that should be copied or reiterated at different institutions like think tanks, CSIS, Atlantic Council, and such. There should be public debates on this. There should be hearings on this, um, you know, to get the congressional dialogue in, in, into this. And then the, I just make a historical point. This is the first time in 30 years, maybe longer, and by that I mean since the end of the Cold War, that we're dealing with in a situation where there is, there has to be consideration of, of escalation risk. And I think we're a little bit, um, we're a little bit uh, soft from three decades of uh, real intense thinking and engagement on this. It was a regular course of policymaking to address these issues when we were confronting the Soviet Union. Uh, Phil's predecessors were regularly moving forces in very, I, I guess you could say offensive ways up and down the alliance's frontier in response to Soviet actions, always taking into account, you know, what were the escalatory risks? Uh, these are things that, that um, have, uh, have withered on the wine, vine over time. I can say when I was um, a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for NATO and Europe Policy back in, 20, uh, in 2001 and 2005, I was actually kind of stunned at how few meetings NATO had on these issues because there really wasn't, quote unquote, a need. And we've become soft in this, in this, in this realm. We've lost our finesse in, in this realm. And it's something we're going to have to, to build back up, not just to deal with Russia, but deal with also other powers that have nuclear weapons. Um, Ian, since you just finished, there's a question specifically for you. <laughs> I want to make sure I understood your proposal correctly. Does maintaining the safe area within Ukraine include U.S., NATO, U.N. peacekeeper boots on the ground? If yet, if yes, what forces do you do you so securing that area? Do you use to secure that area? 
The short answer is yes, it would involve Western military forces. In an ideal world, I think it could be the core of that could be a NATO force. And I would use as a core of that NATO force, the NATO response force, uh, its air and, and ground elements. Uh, it would require a presence and we'd have to be prepared to be there for the long haul because I think this is gonna be a long-term confrontation o o o o over Ukraine. Uh, and it, it's, we have the capability, we have the opportunity because these, so much of Western Ukraine is uncontested in that there are no Russian forces there. Uh, and we could do it in a way that would properly manage the escalatory risks that come with getting engaged in such a conflict. And the reason why I believe the risks are manageable is because the nuclear balance of power between the West and Russia have not changed. The principle, the dynamics of deterrence have not changed. We wouldn't be directly engaging or intentionally engaging Russian forces in such an operation. Putin would be in the position where he'd have to decide whether or not he wanted to counter those forces through aggression. And based on the performance of Russian forces in Ukraine today, I doubt he'd like to add to his already heavy burden, taking on forces that are, demonst have, are demonstra demonstrably far superior to those of Russian forces. So this is a doable operation if we have the political will to undertake it. Sorry, I'm answering one question online. <laughs> Uh, we've well there's several that I think were answered in relation to how do we have this conversation and influence what the policymakers are thinking and uh, yes the four of us are involved in a group that tries to do that every day and we need to up, up do it and there's got to be efforts and other think tanks of which people on this call are parts of um, but uh, we need to do it and we need to do it quickly because uh, as, as Phil says, every day the risk is going up. Um, what should be, another question, what should be the response to Russia's violating international law by using the Black Sea for its aggression in Ukraine by shooting its missiles from planes flying over the Black Sea? So I haven't brought this up because it, I, what I don't want to do is get into direct criticism of decisions that have been made because I know when I was a SACUR, I didn't appreciate old SACURs doing that. But, but let's just remind ourselves that we, we, the United States, bought and stationed four Aegis destroyers and stationed them forward in Spain specifically for the East Med and the Black Sea. And, and we don't see those engaged. Um, I think that uh, in an abundance of caution, which relates to the conversation we just had about being deterred, in an abundance of caution, we have actually moved U.S. forces away from this um, in the air and on the sea. Now, we, we have a different model on the ground. We're forward on the ground because... That's where we need to be, but but on air and sea forces, I think there have been some specific decisions to to avoid at all costs, and I'll just stop there. Uh, we've got some other comments and questions, um, and and one I think we've addressed, but I'll do it a little bit differently using that question. I want to thank you for your thoughtful discussion. I'm concerned about how long Ukraine can maintain its spirit and ability to fight on without more and faster support from the world. I have yet to hear a real answer about why they're not establishing a no-fly zone. Focusing on Putin's losses on the ground just deflects from the fact that he will resort to more and more to long-distance air attacks. I mean, I think, I think the answer, or at least part of the answer is that we all think, and when I have a, more of a discussion on risk, that we need to up 
what we're doing. We need to be sure that there is no question in the Ukrainian, the people of Ukraine and the Ukrainian armed forces mind that they're going to get what they need as fast as we can get it there. And I don't think any of us are satisfied that's the case right now. We need to push that. As far as the no-fly zone, that's the whole Putin is, we've deterred ourselves and he's deterred us. Um, is it a satisfactory answer? No. Could I just add one thing? You know, some of us are physically talking to leaders on the ground there. Uh, military and MOD leaders on the ground. I don't talk to the more political people. But, but if you have watched the way the Ukrainian people talk when they are interviewed, and they're, they're pleased for close the sky, close the sky. And, and what we have seen over time is um, the, the zeal or the desire about NATO has faded because they don't see NATO closing the sky or coming to their aid. And they, they are now in a mode where they uh, almost structurally will always say, we really appreciate what the United States is doing for us, but we need more. And I see that structuring of their conversation as the indication that they're beginning to worry that the U.S. is not going to do more. And I think that we need to, at some point, also have a, an internal conversation about hearts and minds. Do, do we want Ukraine to look to us and look to the West as a part of their security guarantee and their partnerships of the future? Or are we going to allow the hearts and minds of, of great Ukrainian people to drift away from us because they see that we have not done enough to, to ease their suffering? And that's really hard for us to think about here sitting in our nice offices and having our nice lunches and doing our thing, plenty of water to drink and no bombs coming down on our head. But it gets a little bit closer to the heartstrings when you're a refugee. And oh, by the way, when you left Mariupol, your son and your husband was sent to Russia and you were sent to the West and you don't know whether you'll ever see him again. I just believe we need to um, we need to understand that the cost of our delay and our underperformance in some ways at some point will cost us in, in that regime. Mm -hmm. I think it's already costing us. And we're hearing very frank statements such as by the chief of staff of Zelensky, uh, Yermak, that we are disappointed uh, by the US and by, by NATO. And I think that on the closing of the sky, it's been, well, how long? Two weeks since the speech to the joint session of Congress, where he specifically said, if you can't do the no-fly zone, I have an alternative. And we still haven't acted on that alternative, either the S-300s or something comparable, and the MiG-29s. There has to be a way, despite the publicity now, but there has to be a way to get those in over land or, or, or get up our nerve and fly them in. Uh, we have to remember what we, we declared that the mission at the beginning of this conflict was to raise the costs to the Russians for their aggression. But I think we've lost our nerve in raising the cost beyond where they've been for the first few weeks of this war. And we're not prepared to do something more decisive that could shift the course of events on the ground and, and more likely end this sooner rather than later than staying on the course we're on. So, uh, we should remember raising the costs does mean uh, not just maintaining the status quo and not just maintaining a steady state of pressure, but doing more uh, to have more decisive effect. I just add on to that again, the emphasis on time. We need to do more now to help the Ukrainians bring this to a just and conclusion. Because the longer this goes on, the higher the risk of Ukraine actually losing this and the higher the price we will have to pay in response to that situation, be it forced deployments uh, in Eastern Europe or worse, through a spillover of the conflict in the way that results in the engagement of the Alliance and US forces. So we wanna minimize our costs and increase the likelihood of Ukrainian success and survival. We need to do more now along the lines that uh, 
my two colleagues have just articulated. We need to do so urgently. There, there have been a couple of questions about whether we're, we, those of us on the panel and others, are carrying this message uh, to the decision makers. And the answer to that is yes. Uh, I have been personally involved with all three of these gentlemen uh, doing exactly that. And it's constant. And it's there's a larger group uh, doing exactly this stuff. Uh, General Breedlove's going to have to go in a minute. He's in Georgia with a schedule that I interrupted. Um, but I have one question. I'll ask one more question. Where is the line between supporting Ukraine as it makes decisions on how to end hostilities and aspects of those negotiations that might strengthen Putin's position going forward, making him even more dangerous? I'll take the first shot. Uh, one thing that I've been writing to friends about just for the last several days is I think we need to be very, very careful that we and that we don't allow our allies to be getting into President Zelensky's business now to try to take a less than optimum solution for a quick end. I think Ms. President Zelensky has some very strong uh, um, things that he wants to do about the territorial integrity of his country. And he's been making some pretty realistic compromises to get there. But I'm pretty sure Mr. Putin is not going to accept territorial uh, integrity of Ukraine, even just to the start of this current conflict, much less to pre-2014. And so I think we're going to see some uh, loggerheads. And I, I, for one, am not an advocate for uh, nation strong arming Zelensky to get a quicker uh, answer to this. I would agree with that. I think we have to be careful to uh, defer to the Ukrainians' judgment on these fundamental issues that affect their, their, their sovereignty, their future viability as a, as a country. Uh, give them our best advice, but uh, at the same time, we have to be, be very careful not to push a bad compromise for the sake of a quick ceasefire, which, as we've seen since 2014, they don't last very long anyway when you're dealing with the Russians. Uh, so uh, there may be a tendency within NATO, if, if there is a ceasefire and the talks get serious, to start pushing the Ukrainians to cut a second-rate deal. And we'll have to be, you know, standing in the way of that kind of bad advice to the Ukrainians. Yeah, I guess I would just add is that, you know, ultimately Ukraine has to make its own decisions about its sovereignty and its security and what it feels is a reasonable outcome and justifiable outcome to this conflict. But the West should not forget, cannot forget that what it is doing today and what it is not doing today and what is willing to do tomorrow and what is not willing to do tomorrow is going to profoundly shape Kiev's decisions. So Washington, European capitals and NATO, we are parties to this conflict and its outcome, whether we like it or not. And on the case of NATO membership, I am really troubled with the flirtation that uh, Ukraine has with neutrality and abandoning its NATO aspirations. Because in my view, if Ukraine abandons those aspirations, it's going to be due less to Russian aggression and pressure than the fact that NATO has kept a closed door to Ukraine. And that, to me, is really troubling. Phil, I know you have to go. Uh, and well, thank you for being here. We'll go a couple more minutes here, but thank you very much, Phil. We'll be in touch shortly. Uh, I, we're not going to be able to cover all the questions. There's a lot of very good ones, and they're they're still coming in. Uh, I, I want to make a comment, and I, and people can respond to that. You know, one of the things that I think led not only Putin but certainly the United States to misjudging Ukraine was we've been free for so long. The people of Ukraine, they're they. Either they have lived under or their first generation of families that le lived under Soviet criminal rule. They had to go to church in the forests. They had shortages on everything. They had repression. They whispered in where the, even family meetings. 
There was the Gulag, all of that. They are fighting for their freedom because they know what it's like not to have freedom. We've lost sight of that in many ways because we've been free for so long. What we're seeing are people that are fighting. When they became free and independent in 1991, it was bloodless. Everybody predicted it was going to be bloody, but 92% of the people voted for independence and it was peaceful. Putin is making them fight their war of independence now. We had other countries helping us when we fight, fought our war of independence. They made, in, in many cases, were active measures involved. We need to do more. 